All right, I need to check in again. You guys have a good Thanksgiving weekend? I think I caught you in that food coma. did this past a week ago Sunday talking about trusting God and if you missed last week's message I just want to encourage you hop on our website communitycc.com you can go in our app you can watch it there go to our YouTube channel whatever because he talked about the secret of being content in all circumstances in all circumstances good bad how do you stay content can you can you imagine if we learned the secret of being content no matter what life brings us the the peace and the calm it's a fantastic sermon and talked about the secret starts with Jesus like these two young ladies just said I'm starting with Jesus this morning that's what I'm talking about like let's celebrate that real quick that's that's the secret to being content. You get to Jesus and follow him from there. And one of the things Pastor Scott talked about in this whole being content and following Jesus thing is the power of being thankful and how it transforms our minds. And he planted that seed last week. We had Thanksgiving. And today we're going to continue on that thanks giving kind of thankfulness journey and look at some reasons to be thankful. My parents taught me early on, always look at the bright side, Tim, no matter what. I mean, dark, dreary, rainy day, look at the bright side. There's always reason to be thankful. And it turns out that's not just great advice like Pastor Scott talked about. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 18 says, be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica, and he, and he just writes, be thankful in all circumstances. And I read that, and I'm like, okay, Paul, that's great, but hey, can we settle down a little bit, Paul? I mean, do you ever read a verse like that, and you're like, that's pretty good, but that's a little extreme. Like, did you notice... It's amazing to me the irony of how huge the word all, three little letters, really means when you start thinking about it, right? How, how big is that word in this? Because I'm pretty good at being thankful in some circumstances, amen? We're good at that one? I can find thanks in actually most circumstances, but all circumstances, Tim, this is rivalry weekend. Maybe we're thankful, maybe we're not with our college football teams. I don't know. Some of you guys are thankful. You mean I'm supposed to be thankful when I don't win the game or even make the team or I make the team and then coach is like, nah, and I get cut. Like I'm supposed to be thankful then, Tim? You mean I'm supposed to be thankful when I have a bad day at work? Things don't go my way when I don't get the raise. In fact, I actually get a pay cut or worse, I lose my job. Really? That, that's what Paul's talking about here. All like if that's included in that all. When I'm sick, when I can't leave my house or I've had to leave my house to go to the hospital. Really, Tim, then Paul, is that what you're talking about? Be thankful then. I'm at a funeral for a loved one. Really, Paul? Be thankful then? Well, Paul's instruction is 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Be thankful in all circumstances, good times, hardships, trials, persecution, sickness, pain, depression, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong in Christ Jesus. So today I want to look at thanksgiving, being thankful, and give you four reasons why you can always, no matter your circumstances, always find a reason to be thankful when we look at Jesus. Because that is what he says here. This is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. When we look to Jesus, the secret of being content, like Pastor Scott talked about, 
There's a lot of reasons. I'm going to look at four of them today. Four reasons you can be thankful. If you're taking notes, this is the first one. They're in your app. If you open up the Community Christian Church app, there's some fill in the blanks there, scripture, some links for you. But this is your first one. You can be thankful for Jesus. Thank you for healing me, Jesus. And if there's one thing Jesus excelled at, Let's talk about healing for a second. I mean, you can open up, you can open up scripture to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the eyewitness accounts, and you can start seeing story after story after story of Jesus healing people that he met. And here, here's what's cool. Like there's a story, there's a story Luke tells it about these guys with leprosy. That, that was like a death sentence if you had leprosy 2,000 years ago. You were thrown out of the city and just good luck. Like they come to Jesus, they beg him. He heals all of them. And I love this. I love that he healed all. He didn't heal like, hey, the first seven of you, you're good. Sorry, last three, tough luck. You don't see that in Jesus. When he heals, he healed all 10 of them. So he heals physically over and over and over and again. In, in scripture, we see that. I love this. You can read stories where he healed people that were literally out of their mind. Demon-possessed people. People that nobody else knew how to even be around. Jesus went to them and healed them. It's amazing. He's, he excels at healing. He healed physically. He healed mentally. He healed socially. There's the, the woman at the well, and he gives her hope when she didn't have any, and that, that kind of reconnected her socially. Then, then he heals spiritually. He always, listen, Jesus always healed what was most important. He excelled at all these other healings, but he always healed spiritually. The woman that was caught in adultery and brought before him, what are we supposed to do? Kind of this trick set up Jesus gives a little lesson, and then it's just him and her, and she's terrified, and he encouraged her. So he, he protected her, and he healed her, like, socially. But then, he says, your sins are forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Jesus healed physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, when you look at how Jesus healed, he always healed what people needed the most. And here's the beauty of that. You can read these, and this is eyewitness accounts. These are eyewitness accounts 2,000 years ago, but that same healing is available today. That same Jesus who healed those people rose again from the dead. He's not in the tomb any longer. He's currently preparing a place for us and offers healing. He says, follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because we all have a problem, right? Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But look at the response because of that sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Purify us from all unrighteousness. Not some, not a few things. All unrighteousness. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. Many followed him. And look at, he healed them all. The prophet Isaiah in a for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed Jesus heals and so the question is why don't we accept that right we know the truth here he's already gone to the cross he's already paid the price for our sins Peter said it very clearly in 1 Peter 2, by his wounds, you are healed. He's paid the price. He's made the way. So why don't we accept that healing? I think one of the reasons, knowing that truth, one of the reasons is maybe we feel like he's not able to relate. 
Like, well, these stories are a couple thousand years ago. Like, Jesus doesn't hear me. Like, I, I'm asking him. I don't know if he can relate to my situation. I don't know if he's even listening to me. And that's the beauty of Jesus because he didn't stay in heaven and look down. He came down from heaven and experienced everything that you and I are facing right now and says, I will take care of that. I will heal in spite of us thinking that maybe he doesn't hear us, which is the second reason we have to be thankful. Not only thank you for healing me, but secondly is this, thank you for hearing me. You ever had an unanswered prayer? Yes, me, first one up. How many people in here have ever prayed something? You were earnest and you got absolutely nowhere. Like you just heard nothing, like nothing happened. You know what I'm talking about? Like, and, and we think, man, that's an unanswered prayer. God doesn't listen. God doesn't hear. But I want to encourage you today, before we say, God, where are you? We get upset about those moments. I want to look back at Jesus. And I want to look at how he instructs us with regard to prayer. And let that be the foundation on how we approach God. Because Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. And before we say anything to God, prayer starts with our attitude. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. When you pray, Jesus, these are his words, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. So it starts with humility. It starts with proper focus before we ever say anything to God, what does our attitude look like before God? So you pray humbly and privately, but then you pray these words. Look at this, Matthew 6, 9. Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. So Jesus simply says, hey, when we pray, you start by acknowledging who he is. That's where you start. I kind of think of how often do my prayers start that way? It, a lot of them, dear God, thank you for today. Uh, please help me. But, woo, how often do we jump to that stuff? It's not wrong to ask God for things, but are we praying properly? The way Jesus taught us to pray, he says, before you jump in on that, are you even in the right attitude? Do you know who you're talking to? Have you declared his greatness first and foremost? And then he says in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so here's, here's how I... I mean, I memorized the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you did vacation Bible school, all that kind of stuff. You earn points for your team. Get a candy if you memorize this verse. All right, good stuff, right? Um, but So I knew how to say this verse, but when I prayed, it often sounded like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. My kingdom come. My will be done. Actually, God, this is my will for the, your will for me and my life. Let me, let me tell you, God, what your will for my life should be and how I phrase this prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I know your will is for me to be healed. I know your will is for me to get this raise, God, so that I can afford this three-bedroom, two-bath house in a nice neighborhood and get a new car in Jesus' name. My will be done. <laughs> Too often, that's where my prayers head. And Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done. I want you to think about how powerful that one concept is. If we switch the focus from us to God, and, and not just when we say a prayer before we eat or before we go to bed. What if, what if Jesus is giving us a formula here for how we live every moment of every day of our lives? Where we start every day humbly before him, declaring his greatness 
every moment of every day, being about his kingdom and his will and living that out every moment of every day, no matter who we're around and what we're around. What if prayer wasn't necessarily, God, thank you for this food, amen, but Jesus here is telling us there's a better way to do life. I'm listening, will you follow me in this example? Because the more we declare his greatness, the more we surrender our will, and more we're about his will. Did you see what that verse said? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus invites us to live in a way that brings the kingdom of God down into our homes and our neighborhoods. And he says, you guys live out. When you're about his will, his kingdom comes right here, right now. The kingdom we hope for in the future, he invites us to live right now in our lives. A completely different way of living. And then we get to Matthew 6, 11. Give us today our daily bread. Finally! Good grief, Jesus, like all this stuff. We finally get to where we get to ask you for something, right? Give us today our, look at that word, what's that word? Give us today our daily bread. Shout out to the Old Testament where millions of people are walking through the wilderness and God never failed them, but he provided their daily bread and every day was an invitation for millions of people to say, you can trust God. Every day you wake up, there's the manna, your daily bread. God never, never left them. He was listening. He heard them and he took care of them. So what if, again, prayer wasn't necessarily something we do before we eat or before we go to bed, but what if prayer is a different way of doing life like Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We back up one verse from our Thanksgiving verse, and he simply says this, pray continually. What does that mean? Just, it's going to be tough to eat my breakfast with my eyes closed head bowed, then I got to figure out how to get to work. I'm going to drive, Heavenly Father, just guide this car. As my head's bowed and eyes closed, I don't drive a Tesla. I don't have auto. God, help me to get my work done while I pray the whole time. Is that what he's saying? I don't think that's, that's what Paul's saying. He's like, be aware of God 24-7 in how you live your life. You declare his greatness. You're about his will. You surrender your will and you trust him to provide your daily bread. And when you do that, what takes place is his kingdom. You're focused on God's will. Then you can say, look at this. Then you can say, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. When we can honestly say that, everything changes. When we stop being about our will and we're about his will, everything changes. Look what's promised in Matthew chapter 7 when we're about his will and his kingdom. Matthew 7 says, ask. This is Jesus. He just says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. Him who knocks, the door will be opened. This might be the passage that leads to disappointment because you're like, Tim, I have asked. I have knocked, but I haven't heard anything. A bunch of silence. So it leads me to ask you to back up, right? How did you ask? Were you praying the way Jesus taught us to pray? Were you about his kingdom and his will? Because once we align properly there, think about it. Of course he's going to say yes. When our prayers are truly the will of God, of course he will say yes. But it's up to us to approach him properly because he's listening. He hears us. 
So why don't we approach him properly? Worry, anxiety. Jesus knows that right off the bat. Uh, when he's done with the Lord's Prayer, he continues on in Matthew 6, 25. He says, don't worry about your life, what you eat or drink or about your body, what you wear. This is a statement. It's not a suggestion. This is another one like Paul wrote that earlier, like praying all circumstances. Are you kidding me, Paul? Like, are you kidding me, Jesus? Don't worry about it. Look at, look at the formula for life that he just gave us. In that context where we're about his will and his kingdom, uh, Pastor Scott taught us last week, that's the secret to being content in all circumstances. So it takes worry and gets rid of it. So when we are in the hospital, when we are at the funeral, when we have lost our job, that doesn't take away our trust in Jesus, knowing that he is still in charge. And so we don't respond poorly fueled by worry and anxiety but we still remain at the feet of Jesus knowing that he hears every single one of us thank you for healing thank you for hearing and thank you God for finding me third reason you can always find a reason to be thankful for Jesus he finds us I've made some mistakes I remember as a young kid, my parents, brand new linoleum in the kitchen. I figured I'd test it out to see how fireproof it was with a candle. Uh, fun fact, turns out it wasn't very fireproof at all. I remember racing my brother in the backyard and my parents, please, please side with me on this story because I need a little encouragement. Uh, they gave him a head start. Anybody there, you ever race your brother or sister and the parents unfairly gave a head start. Come on, mom and dad. I'm standing there. I'm ready to go. My brother takes off down to the tree and back. They let him get all the way to the tree. And I'm like, dad. He smiles. Go ahead. So my brother's halfway back. Like I meet him. I'm like, there's no way. So I'm just like, whoop. I just pushed him straight into the barbed wire fence of the farmer next door. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I lost that race. I remember laughing when my mom spanked me growing up. That I don't remember a lot after that happened. I remember making that mistake. We all make mistakes. We all end up lost. Remember the first mistake, Genesis 3, here's the response. First mistake ever made, Adam and Eve in the garden, they take the, the fruit. Here's the response, their eyes were both open, they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, made coverages for themselves. Look at, look at the result, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden on a cool day. Look at, here's what happens, it still happens today when we sin. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What do they do? They cover up, they hide, and we still do the same thing today. I can't tell anyone I messed up. I, I can't let anybody know I made that mistake. And so we clear our, our history on our computers. We delete messages that we've sent. We create false accounts so people won't know. Because if people find out our mistakes, so we isolate and we hide. Again, Paul said we all, we all sin. Romans 3, we all fall short of the glory of God. But here's the result of that. This is what we earn. Talk about wages. The result of, of our actions. We earn things. Those are wages. Paul says the wages of sin is death. Guys, I don't want to just breeze over this and make light of this. This is, we say a lot of things are the worst. Oh, this traffic is the worst. This weather is the worst. Guys, this, this literally is the worst news for all of us. Death, that word means an eternal separation from the love, mercy, Forgiveness and goodness of God. Completely removed for all eternity from God and 
his love. But if we go back to Genesis 3, verse 9, I love this. But, in spite of Adam and Eve, but the gift, uh, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Did they disobey? Yes. Did they mess up? Yes. Did they make a mistake? A horrible one. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Instead of abandoning them, God pursued Adam and Eve. And that pursuit continues right now, today. Jesus pursues us. Jesus finds us for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Look at this. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He finds us. He finds us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He finds us. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He finds us. And Peter says this, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you back to God. Jesus finds us. Bob Goff wrote a a great book, easy read, recommended. It's called Love Does. And he spends a whole chapter talking about his pursuit of his wife and his wife's pursuit of him, what love caused them to do. And in this chapter, he writes, because of our love for each other, I understand a little bit more of how God pursued me in creative and whimsical ways, ways that initially did not get my attention. Nevertheless, he wouldn't stop. And that's what love does. Love pursues blindly, unflinchingly, and I love this, love pursues without end. When you go after something you love, you'll do anything it takes to get it, even if it costs everything. Even if it costs your son. In spite of everything I've done, In spite of everything that has been done to me, God still pursues me and he finds me. Reason to be thankful. He heals, he hears, he finds. And he loves. Thank you for loving me. You see, real love means action. Real love, true love always has action associated with it. It's not a bunch of talk. There's always action. I read a news report that 50 years ago in China, halfway around the world, a 19-year-old named Liu fell in love with a widow who was 10 years older than him. Her name was Zhu And they just, it was love. I mean, you know it when you see that that couple that, so the problem was socially, it was a no. Too big of an age gap. And so both families rejected that and, and forbid them to be in love. But love, Liu wouldn't have it, so he and Zhu, because of their love for each other, decided that they would honor their love and they ran away from everyone to the mountains of China. If you do a little Google search and look up mountains in China, you can get lost real fast. There are some crazy middle of nowhere mountains in China. And so listen, 50 years 
they lived in the mountains. They didn't just run away from a little weekend. This will be fun. We'll sleep in a hut. Then we'll go back and mom and dad will fix it all up. No, they stayed in the mountains. Leo and Ju, their love for each other was enough. They started, I read this news article. They had nothing but roots and grasses to keep them alive. Guys, that has to be love. I mean, I could do that for a day or two, but then you start looking at the other person like, I don't know about. I mean, I could use a pizza right now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know about. Like, you look good, but I don't know. <laughs> look, they stayed true. They gave up plumbing, electricity, literally living in the mountains. And look at what he did. He was like, my wife will not, I will not have her hopping around. You know how hard it is to climb up and down mountains? Some of you guys do know that. That's not easy. You don't just take a little stroll. And so Liu said, not my wife. She deserves things like stairs. So over 50 years, look at, he hand carved 60 or 6,000 steps all over the mountainside so that his bride, his wife, would not have to climb the mountain. She could step and go wherever she needed. 6,000 hand carved steps. Mountains are made of rock, by the way, in case you didn't know. That's a big deal, right? You're like, wow. That is crazy. And I debated sharing that story because, I mean, sometimes I complain a little bit. Like, the, my wife, like, like she's amazing. And, and she, you know, she might ask me to do something. And I kind of go, I don't want to take the trash out. And then, but I, here, here, by sharing that story, I apologize to every man. Because here's what I set you up. All the wives can say, hey, remember that Chinese couple? The guy has 6,000. I'll take the trash. I am so sorry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But look, at, here's my point of sharing that. Love does, period. Love is always associated with action. And you know who gave us that example? God himself. God himself shows us that definition of love. Most popular verse in the Bible, John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave action. His one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. First John 4, 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And how do we know? He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God didn't just think about love. God didn't just talk about love. God did love. And his love is always associated with action to prove it. Four reasons to be thankful. When we think about Jesus, thank you for your healing, for hearing, for finding, and for loving. So what happens? What happens when we rearrange our lives to be thankful in all circumstances? Paul writes about it in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Another verse that's like, what? Do not be anxious about anything. Wow. But in everything, by prayer and petition, and here it is, with thanksgiving. Remember, we're talking about everything, anything. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And here's the result. Here's the result of being thankful in all circumstances and approaching God his way, on his terms. The peace of of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again, how to be content in all circumstances? Christ Jesus. How to not worry? Christ Jesus. Get rid of anxiety? Christ Jesus. How can I be thankful in all circumstances? You get to the foot of the cross and realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That, that is how we're thankful in all circumstances, and it completely changes our lives. Not necessarily our circumstances, 
but it does change how we live our lives. No longer reactionary to the bad, but now we are able to be proactive for his kingdom and his will by, again, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, being thankful in all circumstances. This is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Christian author Timothy Keller wrote this about our circumstances and God's love. He said, I'm going to judge my circumstances by Jesus' love, not Jesus' love by my circumstances. So we get to the foot of the cross. We come to Jesus and we truly follow him. And by remembering what Jesus has done for us, we can thank him for healing, for hearing, for finding us, and for loving us. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you for your love. God, your love changes everything. Your goodness abounds. So I pray that we will be thankful in all circumstances as we consider Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.